The German Intercity Express is one of the fastest trains in the world, renowned for its comfort, luxury, and safety, until it careers off the track and crashes at 125 miles per hour. 101 people perish in three minutes in the world's worst high-speed train crash. Now, with advanced computer technology, we will reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Europe, Germany, Munich. June 3rd, 1998, 5.45 a.m. Passengers board the 800-seat Intercity Express. ICE 884 will make seven stops on its 530-mile journey before reaching Hamburg, a popular destination for its connections to business centers and seaside resorts. 5.47 a.m. ICE 884 departs Munich. Its 12 luxury coaches carry more than 400 passengers. The Intercity Express is capable of traveling at 155 miles per hour. It boasts advanced safety features, including carriages made from strengthened aluminum and computerized onboard monitoring systems. In seven years of service, there has never been a fatal accident. It is so advanced that even Amtrak is considering buying the design for use in the U.S. The second stop on ICE 884's journey is Nuremberg. Jörg Dittmann, his wife Sigrid, and their six-year-old son Andre take their seats in Coach 1 at the front of the train. They are going away to the seaside. Well, it was the very first big holiday for my family. So we said, OK, let's have a stress-free break without the car. Well, because on a train you're free to move around, which is a big advantage when traveling with children. Edith Schaeflein is also going on vacation. She boards Coach 5 in the middle of the train. I got on the Intercity Express in Würzburg. I was on my way to a health resort. And I was due to get off in Hamburg. Udo Bauch takes the ICE train because its smooth ride allows him to work on the journey. He boards Coach 12 at the rear of the train. I got on the ICE at Fulda Station. I was on a business trip to a conference in Hamburg. I wanted to prepare for the day ahead, so I found a compartment, sat down and worked on my laptop. Germany's high-speed ICE train is a prestige project from a country famed for its engineering skills. It is launched on June 2nd, 1991 to extravagant state celebrations. Speeds of 155 miles per hour are routine and significantly cut journey times. But speed and safety are not the train's only selling points. Its luxurious coaches are air-conditioned the seats are equipped with headphones and offer a choice of music. Some even have television screens. It looks like the business class cabin of a plane, exactly what the train's designers want. The ICE is an instant hit. Only two years after its introduction, more than 65,000 people a day use the service. Many lured away from air travel by its speed, comfort, and convenience. That it should fail is unthinkable. 10.56 a.m. Five hours into the journey, the 400 passengers on board ICE 884 are just 40 minutes from Hamburg, their final destination. 
So far, it has been an uneventful journey, but that is about to change. The bang was just beyond any description. All I can compare it with is the moment when a supersonic jet thunders through the sound barrier. And this happens right next to your ear. And at that moment, a shard of metal came slicing through the armrest between my wife and my son. The huge metal shard creates a gaping hole in the carriage floor. I just said, get out, get out, get out of the compartment. Raus, raus, raus aus dem Abteil. Elsewhere in the train, passengers hear the bang, but they're unaware of what's happening in coach one. Edith Schäflein is in coach five, in the middle of the train. There was an enormous bang. And the people in our carriage jumped up and wondered what it was. But then it all went calm after that. The train continued smoothly and so everyone sat back down. At the very back of the train in coach 12, Udo Bauch is absorbed in his work. I didn't hear anything beforehand, unlike other passengers who've reported hearing noises. But that's probably because I was concentrating. I was working on my computer. 10.57 a.m. The damaged ICE 884 is still speeding through the countryside at 125 miles per hour, with a huge shard of metal sticking through the floor of Coach 1. Jörg Dittmann takes immediate action. He leads his wife and son out of the damaged coach to alert the train crew to what he has just witnessed. I found the train conductor in the third coach. Getting there from coach one seemed to take forever. It felt like I had to run the length of the train. It took ages. It was terrible. But the train conductor tells Jörg that according to company rules, he must investigate the incident before he is authorized to activate the emergency brakes. Jörg leads him back to Coach 1 to inspect the damage. It takes them one minute to get there. 10.58 a.m. ICE 884, with 400 people on board, is hurtling towards the town of Escheda at 125 miles per hour. In one minute, this sleepy town will become synonymous with the worst accident in the history of high-speed rail travel. One of its residents, Erica Carl, is at home with her husband. Their house is next to a road bridge, just 65 feet from the railway tracks. I was sitting in the kitchen with my husband having a cup of coffee, and we were talking about changes we wanted to make to our garden. It was a lovely summer's day, no indication of what was about to happen. On board ICE 884, Jörg Dittmann knows something is seriously wrong with the train. I came back with a conductor, and by then the whole train had started to sway from side to side, so we were thrown about the carriage. ICE 884 is approaching the Escheda Road Bridge at 125 miles per hour. Hopefully this thing will come to a stop somehow, and nothing terrible will happen, is what I thought. But the worst did happen. Seconds from disaster will continue in a moment. We now return to seconds from disaster. A routine trip on a German intercity express is about to turn tragic. Four hundred passengers are unaware that anything is wrong with the train. All except for one man. Jörg Dittmann is sitting with his family in coach one when something tears through the armrest. Now he's trying to persuade the conductor to stop the train. 
dachte irgendwie auf so wieder geschlingen ist. Even when the train started to sway about, he didn't show any signs of willingness to pull the emergency brake. Ziehen wollte oder sonst irgendwas, weil er erst mal geguckt hat. He just wanted to find out what was wrong. We came to the first coach where we'd been sitting, and I was just about to point to the spot and show him the damage. And that's when it happened. At 125 miles per hour, ICE 884 derails and hurtles towards the road bridge. At 10.59 a.m., Erica Carl and her husband Dieter hear the noise. My husband said, I think it's a plane crash. And then there was deathly silence, and not even the birds were singing. Erica Carl inadvertently becomes the first person on the accident scene. Our door has a glass pane, so we could see that a train was right by our front gate. Then I said to my husband, there's an ICE lying outside. In the quiet town of Escheda, only 81 miles from Hamburg, these are the photos that Erika Karl takes. A 50-ton carriage has landed in her backyard. Amazingly, the only damage to her house is a broken window pane. Damage to the train, however, is colossal. More than 400 passengers are on the crashed ICE. Jörg Dittmann is back near his seat in coach one at the front of the train. I looked at the train conductor lying on the floor, and he looked at me, his face covered in blood. So we stared at each other, saying, you OK? Remarkably, the train conductor, Jörg, and his family have only superficial wounds. They are able to walk away from the accident. But further down the train, Edith Schaeflein and Udo Bauck are seriously injured, along with more than a hundred others. 11.05, six minutes after the crash. As emergency services arrive, the enormity of the disaster becomes apparent. News pictures reveal that the double-lane, 300-ton road bridge has totally collapsed. The devastation is breathtaking. Andreas Effinghausen is one of the first policemen on the scene. I could see these railway carriages, compacted into each other, bent and twisted upwards, five, six meters in the air, right up to the top of the embankment, and the entire concrete bridge had gone. It was lying on the ground. It was a scene of total devastation. Eight of the ICE's coaches are now in an area barely larger than the length of a single carriage. Hundreds are still trapped in the wreckage. Udo Bauck, who moments before was preparing for a business conference, is now seriously injured. I was lying there, my leg paralyzed, scared that I was going to die. Andreas Effinghausen hears Bauck's cry for help, but he is unable to drag him from the wreckage. I made contact with one of the rescue team leaders. I told him that I had found a seriously injured man on the train. The rescue team sends for specialized equipment. They had to cut the roof off to get me out, and I was in agony. So the paramedics gave me strong painkillers. But the side effects of the drug meant that my breathing stopped temporarily. And then I went into a coma. I don't remember anything about the rescue after that. How I ended up in a helicopter and was flown to Hanover. I don't recall any of it. 11.25 a.m. Initial estimates put the number of casualties at 40 dead and 40 seriously injured. Edith Schaeflein is trapped in coach five with injuries to her legs. Then the first fireman appeared and asked how I was. 
I said I was fine. I couldn't feel any pain because of the shock. And so then he helped me out of the window on the other side of the carriage. Despite her injuries, Edith Schaeflein manages to climb out of the window and is taken to the hospital. By 1.45 p.m., 87 people have received emergency treatment. 27 of the most critically injured are airlifted to the hospital. Rescue workers have no idea how many people are still trapped inside the train. But while there's the slightest hope of finding more survivors, the operation continues into the afternoon, evening, and night. During the night, the rescue teams discover the bodies of two railway workers in the wreckage. They had been carrying out routine maintenance on the track when the train crashed. The death toll now climbs to 81. Over the next 48 hours, emergency services continue their desperate search, but no one else is found alive. At 6.42 a.m., almost three days after the crash, the rescue operation is called off. 101 people die, and 105 are injured in the world's worst high-speed train crash. In a matter of seconds, an unblemished safety record is shattered in a devastating accident. Now we rewind the events of that fateful day and go deep into the investigation to reveal what really happened. Advanced computer simulation will go where no camera can, into the heart of the disaster zone. Within hours of the crash, news journalists seize on a simple explanation for the accident. The cause of the crash remains uncertain, but first reports said that the train had hit a car which was on the railway tracks. It crashed through the guardrail of a bridge over the main line. This is a, a billion to one chance. During the cleanup operation, this theory is given a boost by the discovery of a vehicle crushed under the wreckage. But as investigators examine the crash site further, forensic evidence increasingly contradicts this as being the cause of the accident. To begin with, the first passenger carriages, although derailed, show no signs of a collision with another vehicle. What's more, the power car at the front of the train is completely undamaged. Investigators conclude that if another vehicle had caused the accident, there would surely be some evidence of this at the front of the train. So how did the car end up beneath the wrecked ICE? The discovery of the car's registration provides the final clue. Jürgen Vigor, who would later prosecute at the Ascheda trial, sets the record straight. To begin with, there was a rumor that the crash was caused by a vehicle which had fallen from the bridge. But it was quickly discovered that the car in question was actually a service vehicle used by employees of the train company, working near the track, and who unfortunately also became victims of the accident. The two men had left the vehicle on the bridge while they worked below. In fact, it was the impact of the train hitting the bridge that caused the car to fall off and become buried in the wreckage. It didn't actually have anything to do with the crash. One mystery solved. But if the car didn't cause the accident, what did? The first clue comes not from the crash site, but from four miles back down the railway. This evening, it's emerged that investigators have found damaged rails nearly three miles up the line, where the animals there have found damage to rail tracks six kilometers. Investigators found marks on and close to the track. Could these damaged railway tracks, four miles before the accident site, really be linked to the cause of the disaster? In Coach 1, investigators make a second discovery that could be related. They find a length of steel lodged in the floor of the carriage. What is it, and where did it come from? Investigators now have to travel back to the final minutes leading up to the crash. 
180 seconds before the crash. Jörg Dittmann is sitting with his family at the front of the train. I'm not some pins off. We were looking out of the window, and at that moment, there was this unbelievable bang. And I just said, get out, get out, get out of the compartment. Raus, raus, raus aus dem Abteil. The investigation team realizes that the huge shard of metal, which comes shooting into Jörg Dittmann's compartment, is the same piece of metal later discovered lodged in the floor of Coach One. But where did it come from? The compartment Jörg Dittmann is sitting in is directly over the real wheels of Coach One. Closer examination of the wheels leads to a breakthrough discovery. One of them is seriously damaged, and its steel rim has broken away. Investigators conclude that the piece of metal stuck in the floor of Coach One is in fact the broken rim, which is separated from the wheel. It smashes up through the carriage floor between Jörg Dittmann's wife and son. Robert Lauby is the director of safety with the US NTSB at the time of the Ashetta accident. Part of the wheel that broke it straightened out and it hung up directly under the car. In this position, the wheel was carried along uh, as the train traveled down the track at 112 miles per hour. And it's this unraveled wheel rim that scrapes along the track, sending sparks flying and causing the track damage almost four miles back from the accident site. But losing one wheel rim should not have caused the technically advanced ICE 884 to crash so catastrophically. And since the train travels another four miles before derailing, something else must have happened to turn a mechanical failure into a major disaster. The team turns their attention to the area of track that's immediately before the Ashetta Road Bridge. Here they find some crucial new evidence. Damage to the track indicates that 650 feet before the bridge, the train derails. But why does it derail here and not at the point where the wheel rim shatters four miles earlier? The point where the train careers off the track is where the local branch line crosses the main line. There are two sets of points which can divert rail traffic from the main line to the branch line. To guide trains through these points safely, there are also rail guides known as check rails. Investigators comb the track at the point of derailment and make a crucial finding. One of the check rails, a length of steel, is missing. It has been completely torn away from the track. They need to find it. A detailed search of the crash site reveals nothing. But when investigators examine the inside of the wrecked train, they make another vital discovery. This is Coach One. Our cameras are the first to be allowed inside since the Ashera crash inquiry. Here, investigators make a breakthrough. Damage to the compartment in which Jörg Dittmann was traveling indicates where the wheel rim unraveled, splitting the floor open and piercing the armrest. But only a few feet away in the corridor, investigators find something else. It's the missing check rail, which leaves these gaping holes in the floor and ceiling. With this discovery, they are now able to piece together more of the last moments of the train's journey. 3.6 seconds before the crash, on the approach to the bridge, ICE 884 is still traveling at 125 miles per hour with the wheel rim scraping along the track. As the train runs over the first set of points, the end of the rim scoops up the check rail, which smashes through the floor of Coach One. It is this massive impact that causes two of the wheels at the rear of Coach One to derail. Investigators realize that although ICE 884 has derailed, this still isn't enough to cause the huge devastation of the Ashida accident. In fact, in many derailments, trains often grind to a halt with minimal damage. So if the derailment isn't the final cause of the disaster, what is? 
We will return with more Seconds from Disaster. Seconds from Disaster now continues. Germany's high-speed train ICE 884 crashes in the town of Eschede, killing 101 people. It is the worst disaster in the history of high-speed rail travel. Using advanced computer graphics based on accident reports, we go deep into the investigation to unravel the tragic chain of events. Investigators know that the metal rim of one of the train's wheels breaks and smashes up through the floor of Coach 1, just as it's approaching a road bridge. When it passes over a set of points where the branch line crosses the main line, the rim from the damaged wheel scoops up a check rail and the train derails. Even now, the train should be able to come to a halt safely, but instead, the fatal chain of events continues. The investigation team returns to the crash site to hunt for more clues. They examine the second set of points immediately before the bridge and make an extraordinary finding. There is evidence to suggest that after the points, ICE 884 actually starts traveling on two different sets of tracks, the main line and the branch line. How could this have happened? The team deduces that 1.44 seconds before the crash, as ICE 884 passes over the second set of points, one of the two derailed wheels of Coach 1 smashes into them and forces them open. This means that the carriages following Coach 1 are now guided onto the wrong track, the local branch line, rather than the main line. With the front power car still pulling at 125 miles per hour and the coaches behind it slowing as they leave the main line and derail, the connection between the power car and the rest of the train tears apart. At this moment, emergency air brakes automatically deploy throughout the train. Jörg Dittmann and the train conductor in Coach 1 are hurled through the air. Before we could react at all, there was this jolt, as if a bullet had been fired from a gun. I felt it was all over. Coach 1 is now straddling the main line, and Coach 2 is heading off onto the branch line. But even this doesn't cause the final crash. 1.44 seconds before impact, ICE 884 is derailed, but essentially undamaged, and its emergency air brakes could bring the train to a controlled stop. But that is not what happens, and the compact nature of the wreckage indicates to investigators that this is a particularly violent accident. They now scour the crash site for clues as to how a one quarter mile long train can be compressed into an area the length of a single carriage. They examine the remains of the Ashede Road Bridge to see what part it might have played. The bridge is supported by concrete pillars, which stand about six feet from the tracks. It's this proximity to the railway that becomes the new focus of inquiry. It helps piece together the next sequence of events. About three minutes after the wheel breaks, ICE 884 reaches the Ashete Road Bridge at a speed of 125 miles per hour. The power car and coaches one and two pass under the bridge without touching it. But coach three is pushed outwards by the momentum of the train and slams directly into the pillars. ICE 884 crashes into the Ashete Road Bridge. The third car was diverted over to the siding and swung out to the right, and at that time uh, struck the supports for the bridge and knocked the supports out from under the bridge. When Coach 3 destroys the pillars, the bridge starts to collapse. Coach 4 clears the falling bridge, but catapults off the track and crashes into nearby trees. As Coach 5 passes under the collapsing bridge, it is struck by tons of falling concrete, and the rear half is totally destroyed. 
Edith Schaeflein is traveling in the front half of Coach 5. There was just no time to think. I heard the bang and was thrown about. I was catapulted from left to right. I saw that the windows were shattering and the train buckled so much. It's just impossible to imagine how it was so completely smashed up, so completely ripped apart. Immediately behind her, the falling bridge crushes the restaurant coach to a height of only six inches. The resulting debris now blocks the path of the remaining six coaches and the rear power coach, which hurtles into the wreckage. Udo Bauk is in passenger coach 12. There was a bang, a bang louder than I've ever heard in my life. And then everything happened very quickly. I was flung around the compartment, left to right, up and down, until I was left lying there in agony. 101 people are killed in the crash at Eschede, and it seems to be the result of a tragic chain of events. A broken wheel, some points, and a road bridge, which combined to create the biggest disaster in the history of high-speed rail travel. If this is the case, if this is a million-to-one chance accident, then the reputation of the ICE as a safe train will remain intact. But in the next stage of the inquiry, investigators make a startling discovery that proves the accident could easily have been prevented. Stay tuned for more seconds from disaster. And now, Back to seconds from disaster. Germany's high-speed ICE train has crashed, killing 101 people, all because of a broken wheel. It is the worst disaster in the history of high-speed rail travel. After the accident, the rim from the wheel in question is taken to the Fraunhofer Institute in Darmstadt, Germany for forensic testing. Investigators are particularly interested in the wheels of this train because they are of a new design, unique to the ICE. Seven years earlier, on June 2nd, 1991, the ICE is launched. One of the aims of the Cutting Edge project is to reach a new standard in luxury and ride quality for its passengers. The train has solid steel wheels, known as monoblock wheels. But Deutsche Bahn, the German railway company that runs the ICE, soon experiences problems with them. Shortly after the trains went into service, they found that they had a technical problem with wheel wear. The wheels were wearing in, in a strange pattern. When this happened, especially in the trains were traveling at high speed, noise and vibration would be generated and transmitted up into the passenger car. The carriage where this is most evident is the restaurant car, where plates are shaking and glasses are spilling. It's the kind of image Deutsche Bahn can do without. To eliminate this restaurant rumble, something has to be done to maintain the ICE's reputation for smoothness. Professor Roderick Smith, mechanical expert at Imperial College London, explains. Now, what steps can you take? It range from radical redesign of the track itself, which is clearly not practical, huge redesign of the vehicle, some changes to the suspension of the, the vehicle, or some changes to the wheel. And so a fairly obvious answer, most people would think that changing the wheel might be the cheap solution. Within two months of the ICE's prestigious launch and under pressure to find a solution, Deutsche Bahn decides to replace its original monoblock wheels with dual block wheels. But how does this improve the smoothness of the ride? A traditional monoblock or one-piece wheel is made from a single solid piece of steel. But a dual block or two-piece wheel has an inner wheel surrounded by an outer rim sandwiched between are sections of rubber designed to help absorb vibrations and provide a smoother ride. 
on August 31st, 1992, Deutsche Bahn approves dual block wheel type 064 for use on its ICE trains. The new wheel instantly improves the ride and cups and saucers no longer shake and rattle in the dining car. Wheel type 064 seems to be a big success. That is, until one of them fails and triggers the terrible chain of events that causes the Ashida train crash. Scientists at the Fraunhofer Institute are now anxious to know whether there is an inherent fault in this type of wheel that could cause further accidents. Using sophisticated test rigs, they simulate a lifetime of wear in a matter of days. While examining the broken rim from the Ashida train crash, they make an alarming discovery. The wheel rim fractured through metal fatigue. In simple terms, fatigue occurs when a movement is repeated over and over again, causing a stress break at a weak point in the metal. There are examples of it occurring in everyday life. This paper clip is a good example. If we bend it to and fro, relatively small number of time, you can break it easily. That's exactly what was happening inside the rim of the uh, wheel that broke in the Ashader accident. A wheel on a train actually flexes slightly as it turns because of the massive load of supporting the moving train. These movements are minuscule, but the constant flexing of the metal can eventually cause the wheel's destruction through metal fatigue. With a dual block wheel, there is a layer of rubber between the wheel and the rim. The soft rubber allows the outer rim to flex much more than on a monoblock wheel. As the separate rim wears down through use, the flexing increases. Without thorough inspection, the wheel rim can become too thin, and a small defect can become a crack that eventually fractures, causing the outer rim to break away from the inner wheel with devastating results. In the case of ICE 884, this is exactly what happens. But metal fatigue fractures in train wheels usually develop over a period of months or years. So why didn't Deutsche Bahn technicians notice it during routine maintenance inspections? This is the answer that Deutsche Bahn gives to the investigation team. Instead of relying on their sophisticated metal fatigue detection equipment, it turns out that engineers at Deutsche Bahn's Munich maintenance facility had been carrying out safety checks on ICE's wheels with nothing more advanced than a flashlight. As an inspection technique for any wheels, the use of torches will only pick out the largest and most dangerous of cracks. It won't pick out tiny fatigue cracks at an early stage of their life. So in terms of detecting potential cracks on the inside of the rim of a dual block wheel, it's a completely useless technique. The engineers at Deutsche Bahn's Munich Depot had also been carrying out tests with their high-tech testing machines, but the data was considered unreliable as the equipment constantly came up with error messages. However, in the week leading up to the Ashida train crash, the wheel that would cause the accident was highlighted as being defective in three separate automated checks. When investigators download the maintenance report from the train's onboard computer, they make another astonishing discovery. They find that two months before the crash, Conductors and other train staff lodge as many as eight separate complaints about the unusual noise and vibration coming from the bogey that carries the defective wheel. Deutsche Bahn doesn't replace the wheel. Wheels of this type have been in use for 40 years, but Deutsche Bahn's dual block wheel is a new design and has never been used on a high-speed train. In fact, Dual block wheels are traditionally found on one of the slowest moving forms of rail transport, the tram. 
In July 1997, almost a year before the Ascheda train crash, the company that runs the tram network in the German city of Hanover discovers dangerous metal fatigue cracks occurring in its dual block wheels. Even though they are running at speeds of only 15 miles per hour, they decide to change their dual block wheels more often, well before metal fatigue has a chance to develop. The tram company contacts other rail operators running on dual block wheels to inform them of the metal fatigue problem and its simple solution. In fall 1997, they notified Deutsche Bahn. According to the tram company, Deutsche Bahn said that they have not experienced any problems with metal fatigue. Investigators begin to question Deutsche Bahn's inspection procedure for the new dual block wheel type 064. On August 8, 2002, a trial begins against three engineers accused of negligent homicide. The outcome of the trial surprises everyone and shocks the German public. More answers when seconds from disaster returns. You're watching Seconds from Disaster. The investigation into the cause of the Ascheda train crash reveals that tragically, 101 people have died because inspections on the wheel that triggered the accident were inadequate. Two engineers from Deutsche Bahn and an employee from the wheel manufacturer, BVV, are charged with negligent homicide and bodily harm. The engineer's defense is that they had followed the technical standards of the time and that the fracture in the wheel could not have been predicted. Deutsche Bahn is not in the dock itself because in Germany, only people can be tried, not companies. After eight months, the trial ends in controversy. Es gab keinen Schuldspruch, das no one was found guilty. They were charged. Then there was a trial, but there was no guilty verdict returned. In German law, when there is no substantial guilt, a trial may be concluded with no guilty verdict, and a fine can be paid as a compromise. And that is what happens in the case of the Ascheda train crash trial. The prosecution and defense agree to a compromise. No one is found guilty of negligent homicide, but the court fines the three engineers 10,000 euros, around $12,000 each. Families of the victims and survivors of the accident are furious. The court's decision makes their fight for compensation much harder. It's a huge disappointment to me. The fact that German law is in such a sad state. In other countries, curiously, these things work without a hitch. And there are excellent, much better schemes taking care of the victim. Only in our country, strangely, this is not possible. It seems beyond belief. Soon after the accident, Deutsche Bahn did make initial goodwill payments to the families who had lost loved ones in the accident. The amount was 30,000 Deutsche Marks for each person killed, less than $19,000. 30,000 Marks for every dead person. That's just a joke. Deutsche Bahn later settles financially with many victims, but for Edith, money has had a limited effect on her quality of life. I completely ripped apart all the tendons in my legs, and so I still have problems from that. Even now, I have to make allowances every day. Directly after the accident, Udo Bauch spends 17 days in a coma. Today, he is disabled and cannot work. He is united with a policeman who saved his life, Andreas Effinghausen, whom he asks to be the godfather to his daughter Marie, born three years after the accident. And thankful to be alive, Udo builds a memorial. This chapel gets about five to six thousand visitors a year, and it's very popular. People say lots of prayers here for the victims of Eschede. And that is enough proof for me that to build this memorial with my own money was the right thing to do. 
A year after the construction of Udo Bauch's memorial, an official memorial is also built, funded in part by Deutsche Bahn. It's at the site of the crash, next to the new Eschede Road Bridge, a reminder of that terrible summer morning when an extraordinary chain of events unfolds. A poorly maintained wheel breaks and lodges in the train floor, scooping up a check rail and causing ICE 884 to career off the tracks as it crosses a set of points and smashes into the bridge, triggering the world's worst high-speed rail disaster. Deutsche Bahn has removed the dual block wheel type 064 from service and replaced them with traditional monoblock wheels. They maintain that the wheels and the inspections met the standards required at that time and that their engineers could not have predicted a wheel fracture. As of November 2002, Deutsche Bahn claims to have paid more than $30 million to the victims' families and survivors of the crash. Since refitting monoblock wheels, Deutsche Bahn's ICE trains have clocked millions of safe miles, and the popularity of high-speed rail travel continues to soar.